engineer, it means I get to kind of do the best of both. I did start the NGRX project. I have almost nothing to do with that today. It's run by an awesome team who do lots of really good work. Uh, mainly now I work on uh, Angular's kind of web standards stuff, dealing with the Chrome team and standards organizations, things like that. So today's talk is about kind of where we're at, where we're going. Uh, 8.0 came out a couple weeks ago now. Who's already using it? Who's upgraded? Not as many as we'd like to see. Come on, we should talk about that. So it's not that hard, just do this. You can do this while I'm doing my talk, right? We'll make this easy for you. So the update command, right? This will go ahead and do all the updates for you. It will do as much of the work as possible. It'll update your versions, it'll change your code, do all of that great stuff. It's not a scary thing to do. Uh, this is a great blog post from the Air France KLM team. We work with them quite a lot. Uh, if there's a team outside of Google that's doing everything right, I think the Air France KLM team are a really good example of that, and so they're worth kind of following what they're talking about. Their blog is great to read. But they like, they do this quote, and I really like this. They believe that the measure of a healthy code base is how long it takes from kind of coming up with a feature to getting it out into production. Angular feels this way. I think KLM is living this way, and they're a great example of kind of what you can do if you stay up to date all the time. Check out their blog post for more on that. Uh, we try to make this, again, as easy as possible, so we give you the commands to do it. Uh, if you haven't seen update.angular.io, this will actually give you the steps. You just key in kind of what version you're on now and what you want to go to and where you want to, uh, and we'll give you the steps kind of one by one to get to that point, so check this out if you haven't. But really, we're talk here to talk about cool new stuff, right? So what came out in 8.0 that you should know about and that we think is interesting and useful? This is the coolest feature, I think, for me. This is a differential loading or differential serving. And this is this idea that all of us are writing TypeScript, right? We're all writing very, very modern JavaScript. But for the past two or three years, and really for the past five years on the web, we've been taking all this shiny, brand new you know, classes and ES modules and all of this stuff, and we've been converting it down back to ES5, right? So we've been writing all this great code, really fancy syntax, but then we turn it into the old stuff. And that has a couple of problems. One, it's generally significantly slower to take all of this shiny new ES6 code and turn it into ES5 code. You also end up shipping a lot of polyfills, right? And today's kind of modern browser environment, most of the browsers, so Chrome, Safari, Firefox, right, and Edge even, they have all of these new S6 features, right? And so most of us are only ever dealing with Internet Explorer, unfortunately, for this old stuff. But we've been using that as the lowest common denominator. Differential loading gets away from that, and so it lets us serve a bundle specifically for modern browsers, and that's most of them. And then, you know, this kind of old polyfill legacy bundle for the older stuff. This is one of the easiest code savings you get, right? If you want to save something like, I have a number there, 7 to 20% of your bundle, so 10 to 20% of your bundle size, this is for free, right? This is a big, big win for all of your users. And again, as browsers get faster, these native features like async await and generators, all of these things, using the native version is a significantly better experience for everyone. Uh, what else we've done? So we've added some stuff to the CLI with our new builders API. This allows you to extend it. We're adding ng deploy, so like a one command deploy to Firebase or Zite or Azure or any of these cool sites. Web worker support, we just added support uh, from a community member for building web workers in Angular CLI. So this will let you to hit some kind of complex feature, complex calculation, and move it to an off thread, uh, to an off -thread worker. Service worker improvements, so we made a few tweaks to that. Uh, we added lazy loading support via the native import. And again, this is us kind of taking away stuff from Angular using what the platform gives us. This is a big win. It'll make things more flexible. We added some stuff for AngularJS location support. So we're kind of just trying to smooth over the differences between AngularJS and Angular. This makes upgrade a little bit easier. This came from an internal team of ours at Google. Uh, better worse stuff for your IDE, right? Better completions, a little bit of better usage of that. And we did a lot of work on the documentation to actually start a new uh, getting started guide that's hopefully a little bit simpler, but less knowledge up front. Try to make things a little easier to approach if you've never used Angular before. So we've, we've done a lot of work over the past six months. This is kind of a summary of them. Uh, check the blog post, which goes into more details. This is on our blog at angular.io. The one that I really want to call out, and this blew my mind when I saw it at ngconf. If you haven't seen that demo from ngconf, go check it out. This is CDK drag and drop, right? Who's ever built drag and drop as a web developer? Raise your hand if you enjoyed doing that, right? It's awful. It's like one person in the back. You're a liar. Not true. You hated it. So this is easy, right? You can take a div and you can make it draggable. This is really simple to do. And I watched this talk and I went, yeah, but the next thing you do is really hard, right? And the next thing you do is really hard. 
with literally almost no code at all, you can do very, very powerful, very fancy, and you know, things are moving up and down, and the data's handled. CDK drag and drop to me is one of the coolest things the Angular team has built, and really, it was built for our collaborator program, right? So increasingly, we're seeing really cool stuff from the open source community working really closely with the Angular team. If you haven't heard about the collaborators pro excuse me, the collaborators program, the idea is we want to in, uh, enable individuals who are really passionate about Angular, really passionate about open source, to work more closely with our team. And also, if you work for a big company who's really invested in Angular, you're using a lot of Angular stuff uh, you know, across your different projects at your company, we want to give you an avenue to work more closely with the team, give us better feedback, get a little support if you need that. So this is a project we've been working on for the past six months or so. Uh, goals of this, right, we want to make Angular more scalable, less waiting for us to finish features, more working with you to build features. Uh, we want to increase the diversity of the team. This gives us better opinions, better feedback, better ideas, you know. Uh, we want to engage more closely with the community. Your feedback is always important. Create opportunities for people. So a lot of people ask me how I got on the Angular team. I didn't go to computer science school. I didn't get a degree in computer science. I'm a college dropout. I got to work in open source and build some cool stuff, and I really just kept annoying the Angular team until they said, all right, all right, come in the office and sit with us. And that's eventually how I got to work at Google. Really, this program is just taking that and making it a little bit more concrete, right? So if you're working out in the world and you're doing good work, we want to notice that, we want to bring you closer in and obviously ensure the long-term successes of Angular, right? Like, I won't be on the team forever, nobody's gonna be on this team forever. This is bigger than an individual member and so we want to make sure the community is able to plug in and work with the Angular team and make Angular that much better. How to join, right? So if you're in the community, just keep being an awesome contributor. We're watching out on Gitter and Stack Overflow and GitHub and watching for people who are working well with others. Uh, if you're a big org and you want to deal with this, just uh, email devrel at angular.io. That'll come through to me and Steven and Minko, and we can get you plugged into the program. But really, this is what you all came to talk about today, right? It's the Ivy Renderer. So we've talked a lot over the past kind of year, 18 months, about Ivy Renderers. Uh, there's a bunch of really good stuff coming. You know, things are going to be smaller. Compilation is faster. Things are better to do debugging. All these things are good. Our primary focus right now is backwards compatibility though, right? So we want to make sure that all of the applications you've written today are not going to break just because we've released something new and shiny, right? So we've just, just uh, maybe last week, shipped a blog post about our opt-in preview for Ivy. So this is taking your existing applications, beginning to run them with the Ivy renderer. You can do this. You can actually turn this on again fairly easily in the CLI. There's a pretty good guide on our doc site about how to look into this stuff. Now, I just need to be clear with you, this is a preview. So currently at Google, we have about 97.5% of our tests passing. So this is like hundreds of thousands of tests across all of Google, all of the projects that use Angular. Right now, 97, 98% of those are running with Ivy pretty well. Uh, to be fair though, that last 2.5% is always the hardest, right? It's never gonna be the simplest bit to do. So we're moving very slowly through these last kind of couple of percent of tests. And so if your code base falls in this 97.5% of code, then it should work pretty well. The way that we're looking at this at the moment is that if you have not a whole lot of dependencies, you've got a fairly small, uh, a fairly small app, right? Then this is a pretty low risk thing to try out. If you wanna go and try it out, cool. Don't worry about it though if you're not, if you don't have a bunch of free time, if you don't really wanna get it started on this right now. This will become easier, and obviously when we release Ivy as the stable, this will be automatic. So if you've got a much bigger application, this is a little bit higher risk, and maybe don't worry about this at the moment. This is not something you have to do. You're not gonna miss anything. But if you're really, really engaged in this stuff, then you, know, you can try it out this way. I, I'm not gonna dive too deeply into how Ivy works. Eleron's gonna talk about this in a talk a little bit later today. I don't wanna step on his toes. But I do wanna talk about a little bit about how we're gonna think about using Ivy for the future, right? And what do I mean by that? So really what comes next, right? So we're gonna finish this Ivy renderer. We want it to be backwards compatible. We want your existing code to work. You wanna get some of those benefits of debuggability and performance, right? But what do we do with this thing? 18 months later, right? It's not gonna look hugely different from the, the kind of public surface of what Angular looks like. This is why it's backwards compatible, right? So I'm actually gonna change this to what comes next which is more, let's think about some of the things that we need to solve, some of the problems the Angular team knows that we need to look at to really start solving the next gen of, of Angular issues. So, here's an Angular component. Everybody in this room has probably written one of these. If you haven't, this is an Angular component, right? Very simple. This is what we would like to be able to, be able to think about in its entirety. This is a component, right? And if you've seen anything about Ivy, you know that this is what the future of rendering an Angular component looks like, right? We can just write 
a component and render it like every other framework in the world. So this is a big step. Oops, did I step on something? Maybe not. So this is kind of the Ivy API that we've got out experimentally. Even the backwards compatibility previews of Angular, I'm gonna keep talking. Uh, even the backwards compatibility previews aren't using this API, right? This is a low level kind of experiment API. If you are an Angular application developer, this is really what you're doing. This is what your application looks like. You've got an ng module, it's got a bunch of imports, you've got this browser module thing, you've got the common module, you're doing declarations and entry components, right? There's a lot more here than just a component. And then you have to take this thing and you have to bootstrap it, right? So you have to get in a platform and call the platform thing and bootstrap your module and your module will start up and that will actually end up eventually starting up your component. Okay, but if you're doing AOT, well, you, now you have to bring in this other thing that doesn't really exist, and you import this, and you have to change the platform browser stuff, and right, there's a lot going on here that maybe we don't do anymore. So how do we get from that, a kind of large, complex ng module API, to this, right? The much simpler, just render a component on the page. Well, the answer is, honestly, for a lot of people, we're not gonna do that, right? There are two very different things we're talking about here. I showed you an application component. So there, there are kind of two things we're talking about here, right? We're talking about applications. Applications have injectors, they have services, they have DI, right? There's a lot more going on than just a component in an application. We could. So they're two different things. We need to think about them as two different things. And honestly, trying to turn your applications today, these huge apps you're building, into components doesn't necessarily make sense. To me, ng modules are applications. I'm gonna put the asterisks there because they do a lot more stuff. We'll cover some of that as we go through this, but really ng modules to me are applications. That's the way I've always thought about them. And in this case, Angular is great, right? We built this thing to build single page applications. This is what it's really good at. We give you everything you need out of the box. There's a huge information of documentation and community content for building applications. There's a trade-off here though, right? This means that components must belong to applications. Today, there's no way to think about building just a component, right? Loading all of this stuff, all this stuff you need out of the box up front, it can impact performance. And of course, the trade-off of having a lot of information and content and knowledge out there is you feel like sometimes you have to learn all this stuff up front, right? Approaching Angular can be quite scary because there's a lot to it. And I actually learned this last year, not learned this, but this really became kind of very clear to me last year at the NG Girls uh, conference we did after the conference. I didn't get to do this this year, but I worked with two really, uh, really interesting women who almost spoke zero English, and of course I speak zero Hebrew. And so we sat there for the first couple of hours of this NG Girls uh, uh, tutorial day, trying to communicate what we were getting across, trying to get across to these people who'd never experienced Angular before, what the point of all of this was, right? What were we doing? Why were we writing all this code? And for me, it's when we got down to this, the light bulb came on for them, right? All you're doing with all of this code is creating new HTML tags so you can use them in your HTML pages, right? It's not that complicated once this is the thing you realize you're doing, but there's all that other stuff you have to go through to get there, right? You have to pick through ng modules and platforms and renders and all these things to be able to do this. So to me, I think we should think about this slightly differently. We should think about components and applications, but they don't necessarily have to be the same thing. You don't necessarily have to write one or the other. You should be able to do both with Angular, and you should be able to do one or the other or just applications or just components, right? And so really what this means is standalone components. This is kind of an unofficial term, but this is just this idea of thinking about, like, let's just write components. What does that look like, right? Maybe one day I do want to write an application, and it's gonna go into my huge enterprise app, but I'd really like to start by just writing a component or just learning how to write a component before I have to learn how to write an application, right? So what, this should, what should this look like, right? What are the principles we want this to have? Well, we want ng modules to be optional, obviously. You shouldn't have to have an ng module to write a component. These things should seamlessly integrate into larger applications, right? So if you have junior developers or people who are new, they should be able to start writing components, simple stuff, and then plug them into these larger applications. They should be lightweight meaning you shouldn't have to bring along several different Angular libraries, hundreds of kilobytes of code, right? You should be able to use these things in a way that's nice and portable and lightweight without having to think about it too much. And so there are some issues with this approach today with Angular. This is not as simple as it seems, right? But what do we do? We need to deal with our dependency. So how is a component going to get the directives and the pipes that it uses in its application? We'll dive into that. What about dependency injection? Well, dependency injection is kind of part of an application, right? Like, that's where your router lives. That's how you configure these things. 
DI, well, yes, it makes sense for components, but again, it should be optional. It should be something you have to rely on to do this. Probably one of the more challenging problems we're going to deal with is change detection and zones, right? So if you're using zones, I'll come back to this. So zones, right, are going to be a problem if you're building a component to be run in a different framework, in a different application context. Maybe you don't own the whole page. So there's some issues with zones and change detection we need to think about. And of course, this is going to open up some new avenues like Angular Elements, and so we'll get into that. This is what Angular says in the documentation. Components are declared in ng modules. Really what this means to me as a human is that components are compiled inside of ng modules. They belong to them. What do I mean by this? Well, let's go back and look at our very basic component, right? I cheated a little bit here because I, in my template, I'm not using anything fancy, right? Like there are no directives in here. There are no pipes in here. This is just HTML, so it's easy. If I want to use something a little more interesting, so I'm going to use my form control up here, I'm going to use the fancy button component here, there is no way today to tell Angular, well, I want to use the fancy button and the form control directives in this template without an ng module, right? Because you tell Angular that in the import statement of the ng module your component belongs to. So this is actually the reason ng modules exist, is to give us this kind of bucket of selectors, bucket of directives that are available to be used in the components that are declared by the ng module. Again, this isn't going to go away. This is a thing that most enterprise apps are doing. It works pretty well for them. But again, there's a lot of overhead. This is fairly complex. So how do we do components without ng modules? Let's start from scratch, right? So we're going to start with a selector and a template. And it turns out we can already do this for providers. This API exists in Angular today. Providers can be provided directly to a component, and this means every time that component gets up or boots up, it will get an instance of that provider. You can already do this today. So to us, and to me certainly, it makes sense that we should just extend that idea out a little bit. So this is a proposed idea for how we're thinking about doing ng modules. I'm sorry, doing components without ng modules here. In this case, rather than putting the component in an ng module and telling the ng module what's available to it, we're just going to tell the component directly, right? Here are the pipes that are available. Here are the directives that are available. Now, if you used Angular before RC5 in the really early days of 2.0.0, this is actually how Angular used to work, and we took this option out back in the day. And again, I think at the time that made sense when you think about building applications, but in hindsight, three or four years later, we go, well, it would be nice to have it in maybe both places. So this is the, the kind of way we're thinking about being able to use Angular in the way you use it today, but again, make a little more focus without having to bring ng modules into the equation. Uh, so again, just, we always want to make sure that your ng modules that exist already work. So you should be able to bring in either directives or pipes or a whole ng module, right? There are some issues here with tree shaking we need to think about. But in general, this is a nice property. You should be able to write a component. It should be part of a bigger system if you want it to be. And again, this doesn't fundamentally change the nature of how you use Angular today. Uh, and then at that point, you can make it this simple, right? Because then we can bring in that Hello World component. It knows about all of its dependencies and will boot itself up without any kind of external stuff. You should also be able to bring these things and use them in a larger application, right? So I'm writing a huge ng module application here. I should be able to bring in components, standalone components, and use them pretty seamlessly in my ng module, in my art, in my, excuse me, in my larger application. So it should kind of work both ways. And perhaps a simpler version of all that platform browser stuff is, OK, you can choose to either render a component, right, a single component, or render a module, that application module, which then might boot up some components. So again, Kind of conceptually similar, we can render a component, we can re render an app, but we take away a lot of the other boilerplate, that platform browser stuff, all of the bootstrapping, all of that stuff, we should dramatically simplify. Change detection and zones, I mentioned those as kind of one of the big things we're going to have to think about. I like this asterisk. So zones work great for a lot of people. Who today is using zones and doesn't ever think about it? Almost nobody, right? Because it's not an easy thing. So zones are great until they're not until you need to debug, until you're using them in a context where you're using WebSockets, or something kind of out of the ordinary. And then they become a real, real problem for people. They're kind of magical, and magic is great until it's not, right? So Ivy today is, does not depend on Zone.js, but it does rely on it. And what do I mean by this? What I mean is there's no code in Ivy directly that actually knows anything about Zone.js at all. It has no concept of what that means. But because of that, if you're doing Angular applications like you're doing them today, if you don't have zones, then basically nothing happens because we don't know when to run change detection. So let's look at a very simple example here, right? 
In Angular today, if we have a basic clock, it's just got a very simple interval here. We're going to set the time, right, and just render that in the page. This works in Angular today with zones because zones knows when that change interval is happening, excuse me, when that interval is firing, it's plugged into that, and it knows, okay, that center interval is, has fired, now I need to run change detection and update the DOM. If we take away zones, this code just doesn't work. So in IV, the kind of low-level basic API to handle this is we just bring in a function, this detect changes function, and at any point we can just say, right, call detect changes with the component we wanted to detect here, and that's all you have to do. Note that we're not having to inject like a change detector ref and bring us all their stuff. It's just a very simple function we can use to call to tell the application to detect changes. Similarly, we can tell the application at some point in the future, I want you to mark this thing for check, right? Check it later, schedule change detection. But again, we have two very simple APIs here. If we go back to our hello world, kind of basic similar example here, right? In this case, right, again, we change the name with a button click from the UI, but the application doesn't know how to update. It doesn't know when to cause this, when to actually trigger the UI update. So we can use that basic, you know, detect changes low level API here. And most IV code you've seen written and you'll probably see written today looks something like this. This is how it works under the hood, but obviously this doesn't really feel like Angular, right? You shouldn't have to tell Angular run change detection. That's kind of the point of Angular. So like, wouldn't it be nice if we had some primitive, some thing that dealt with pushing data at us, right? What if we'd been talking about this thing for three years and not really knowing about it? We have been, this is observables, right? Everybody's using RxJS already kind of has a solution to this problem. Maybe we're not talking about it, but you already kind of know the answer to this, right? So let's take that time clock example again. Rewrite it to use observables here, and we're gonna say, all right, every second, we're gonna just map this to the current time. We'll render that through the async pipe, and everything's kind of magical here, right? Actually, this code doesn't work without zones either, because under the hood, this is relying on zones to know when to schedule that change detection. The observable is telling us the data is dirty, but zones is still the thing that's actually scheduling the change detection. So, very simple idea. We're gonna just change that async pipe add a new pipe probably called the push pipe. The push pipe will automatically schedule change detection for you, and that should be all you have to change if you want to use the application without zones. This means that if you're using something like NGRX, something that's using observables, or any kind of push principle, this doesn't have to be NGRX, anything that uses these principles is well set up for the future, right? At some point, if you want to remove zones, you're probably 95% of the way there anyway, which we think is pretty cool. Uh, again, some of, some of the stuff Ellen's gonna dive into, Michael's gonna do a talk a little bit later about some of the other cool reactive stuff we can do. But again, this is not an accident in the sense that observables and zones were kind of developed at the same time for us. We knew they fulfilled kind of similar purposes, covered some of the similar bases, and so it turns out that, you know, four years later, this was a pretty decent idea, and it turns out that everybody's using Rx should be pretty good for the future. What else does this unlock for us? Well, if we have standalone components, and we've solved some of these change detection problems, then we can start to do really interesting things. And so Angular Elements is a project that I've been working on now for the eight, past 18 months or so. With this knowledge that IV is gonna change things in the future, we know that there's some really powerful stuff we wanna unlock with Elements, and so this is actually what I'm working on right now. This is a not a controversial statement for a lot of people, but there is a React conference you know, happening kind of yesterday and maybe this week as well, and this is maybe more controversial on the React side of the table. I think for the Angular community, web components now are a clear, clear good idea. They solve a lot of issues for Angular developers. They're very useful. And I think we're gonna get on fully on board with that as well. A great example of this is the Capital One website. So this is a, an American bank. I don't know if they operate in Israel. Uh, huge application written with AngularJS, right? It's been around for years and years and years. And this application actually used Angular Elements to do an upgrade, right? So they're using Angular and AngularJS alongside each other using Angular Elements, and it was complicated for them. They have a really great blog post about how they did this. And we work with this team a lot, and a lot of what we learned from this Capital One upgrade experience is informing our kind of next generation of the Elements API. The other end of the spectrum, right, so we're taking a huge application like Capital One and using web components to do interesting stuff. The other end of the spectrum is stuff like Stencil and Ionic, right, and so Mike's here and he's gonna do a talk about this later. But they're using Stencil and Ionic at a very low level to build web components that they're using in their Angular applications, but also in React applications, and Preact applications, and Vue applications, right? So they're using this very powerful low-level level primitive to extend their reach to everybody. And again, I think what Stencil and Ionic are doing is fantastic. Every single Stencil and Ionic component that's written is one more component that works in an Angular application. So for us, this is nothing but a good thing. 
And of course, this is the problem I always talk about when I'm talking about custom elements, right? Is that the world is different than it was when AngularJS was written. There are lots of frameworks out there. Not everybody gets to write shiny new greenfield web applications, right? You have legacy stuff that's written in old tech. Google has this problem in a huge way. We have a ton of different applications that are running tons of different frameworks. We're rewriting the same date pickers like everybody else is rewriting. Excuse me, like everybody else is rewriting. We can create this mini app idea where you want to take an Angular application, an Angular component, and project it into some other application. Elements give us a really nice API for that. And of course, ng-upgrade, right, is just a very specialized version of this same, I have a bunch of frameworks on the same page problem. Design systems is the other end of this. This is something that Stencil is thinking a lot about. This is, okay, wouldn't it be nice if we could use Angular and these templates and these things that I really like and make them usable in every other web application for my developers, for my designers, for people who may not be complete you know, JavaScript web freaks. They should be able to use just HTML, and wouldn't it be nice if you could use Angular to build these web components? And again, Stencil's doing a great job of this. We're learning from what Stencil is doing here, uh, and I think there's a ton of really, really cool stuff we're able to unlock. And again, a design system component, like a side nav or a date picker, they're not part of an application. They shouldn't belong to an ng module. They're just components, and you should be able to think about those things as just components. So what does this look like with Ivy, right? Potentially, what is the API we're looking like? And this is kind of shifting every day as I mess with it and tweak with it, but this is a pretty good representation of where we're going. So again, back to our very simple Ivy example. We've got a component, we're gonna render it. We want to make this as easy to do for web components, right? So instead of calling the render component, we're going to bring in this new with ng component. We're just going to call it with our function. It's going to turn back to us a web component, and we're done. We can just register that and start using it. This is a huge improvement over the sort of 50 lines or code or so that starts to make it today. But first step here is to just make, again, take a very simple component, write a standalone component, and then very simply take it and make it a web component so it works everywhere. Again, if you want to be able to plug into a larger application, this kind of larger application context, you should be able to pass an injector in to do that. This would give you access to high-level services from an app or you know, all the different things your normal applications would have. But they work without it. You don't have to have an injector to get this component started up, which gives you a lot more flexibility. You can extend these things, right? So this is the basic ng component, and then we're going to extend it, and when the thing gets connected, we can do special work. Here, we're not doing anything magical. This is just using this, the existing API and making Angular a little bit less opinionated. So if you want to do something special, again, you don't have to learn Angular here. This is just the Web Components API. Things work as expected. You can go read MDN about how this works. The other spectrum that I really like to think about is, OK, well, what if I wanted to use Angular and all the tooling that we have, but maybe I don't actually want to use Angular templating. Maybe I'm building a graph with D3 or any of these cool graphing technologies. You don't need Angular templating to do that, but wouldn't it be nice if you could use all of the kind of same Angular concepts? So in this case, like prop there is representing an input, right? So we want to build a very specific web component that's not using Angular for rendering, right? But is using Angular for all the great stuff, tooling and change detection, all of these things. This makes it really easy to consume. So we're going to use that D3 graph, which is a fetch some data from a server here, plug the data into it, and append it to the body. There is nothing Angular on this page. This works in any framework, any application. Again, we're just using standard browser APIs. I think this is really cool because it shows once you simplify the Angular model, Look how much simpler it gets for everybody who's going to consume this thing. There's nothing Angular specific on this page. Uh, this allows us to do very clever stuff. So here's an example of something we're working on where we're taking this same very basic component, extending it out slightly so that we're going to tell Angular and the browser the first time you use this component, go ahead and fetch it. And until then, don't load the code. Don't make me pay the cost of it. This is impossible to do today. It's very, very simple to do with Ivy. And this is the kind of thing we want to unlock. So my goal is for standalone elements and thus standalone components to be available for you in V9. We may or may not hit that target. A lot of that's depending on how well we're doing on Ivy. But this API is nearly ready to go, and it's just really waiting for the Ivy stuff to land. And so this is a question I get asked all the time very, very soon. Hopefully, V9 will get the standalone elements everybody's been asking me for. Uh, big deeper dive with Gil into web components. If you're interested at all, you should check this out. He'll do a much better dive of elements for you. Photon is the last thing I want to talk about. I'm just running out of time. This is a very, very new project for us. Photon, it's a research project from a few members in the team. So we've thought about building applications for a long time, and we've been thinking about building these kind of low-level widgets, design systems. We're also thinking about the other end of the spectrum. So these is massive applications that many of the applications at Google are like. So one example of that is the Google Shopping Express application. This is an Angular app. Is that my alarm going off? I'm 
that's an Angular Express, uh, it's an Angular application. We learned a lot building GSX. It was not easy. I'm gonna skip through these. So it's using pre-rendering, minimal JS payload. We want to load components when they're needed, progressive bootstrapping. We want to make really Angular ease of use and incredible performance easy to do. Uh, we are looking a lot at things like Next and Nuxt and Gatsby. These are great projects on the React and Vue side of the table. We really like them. So we're learning from those. Convention over configuration, these things are great. Photon is really, really early on. It's not a thing yet, but we're learning a lot. The things I want to call out kind of to end this up that we're learning, right? So building sites fast is really, really easy to do, whether it's Angular or React or whatever. Building fast websites is actually really, really hard to get this right, right? So the thing we're learning from that is the same patterns you're using for big enterprise applications may not work if you want to build these fast content first sites, right? So we may need to change some things and this is what we're going to think about. People love the CLI. Like, I've heard from people, if we said take away Angular templates or Angular CLI, people would keep the CLI and say the hell with templates. So we want to make sure that the CLI is part of all these solutions. So as we begin to broaden the reach of Angular, the CLI will be a critical part of this. Standalone components, custom elements, all of these things, you will use the CLI to do this work. So more on Photon soon. This is the thing we'll keep talking about. Uh, for some of the stuff that kind of makes Photon work, check out Craig's talk today. He's going to dive more deeply into Universal. Uh, and Universal is really kind of the backbone of some of the Photon stuff we're thinking about, and he'll talk a lot more about Universal. Just to finish up, this is what Kara, who's our framework TL, said to me the other day. She said that really IV is an audit. And what does that mean? That sounds really boring and accounting-y, and it kind of is. What it means is we've spent kind of the past four years organically building a framework. IV is about understanding what we've built, what we need for the future, and what we can do with the stuff that we've got already. What do we know? What do we not know? We're discovering all sorts of things we didn't know about Angular as we've done this audit. And so really, in summary, Ivy's not going to solve all of your problems. It doesn't solve all of our problems. But it does set us up for a future that we can solve these problems in a sane way, in a flexible way, without waiting for the Angular team to solve all of your problems, right? Right now, you have to ask us for permission if you want to do something cool, like decorators or observable change detection, right? We want to make sure that you're able to build on top of Angular without asking permission for us waiting for us, or really putting you in a place where you're not going to be able to be successful in the future. So Ivy is an audit that lets us look at a much stronger future for Angular. And that's it for me, and I think I'm only two minutes over time, so I'm sorry. Thanks for listening.